labor organization is still analyzing the decision, it is very likely to launch a federal court appeal, according to Union President Mimi Tsankov. The FLRA's order is poorly reasoned and ignores the will of the parties, she said. It represents the last vestiges of the Trump administration's union-busting efforts. Where Trump repeatedly took aim at federal labor organizations, notably in 2018 with three executive orders that weakened the ability of union officials to represent federal employees, Biden has repeatedly proclaimed his pro-union credentials. He revoked Trump's directives and issued his own order in April that said, it is the policy of my administration to encourage worker organizing and collective bargaining. That policy would be easier to implement within the government if Biden had another Democratic nominee on the FLRA. He moved a step closer to that Wednesday when Susan T. Grundman's nomination was advanced by the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. She and other Biden nominees for the agency also were committee approved last year, but then their nominations were not considered by the full Senate. Had Grundemann been in office last month, it is likely that the authority would have reconsidered and perhaps reversed its order to decertify the judge's union, although that decision was never fully implemented as the appeals process unfolded. Sankoff said the decision did limit the union's ability re- to represent its members in discussions with management, including grievance procedures from the day of the initial decision to decertify in November two thousand and twenty the agency failed to recognize us. It didn't engage in any of the liaison activities that they are supposed to engage in from a collective bargaining standpoint. And that continued even under the Bi- even after the Biden administration came into office, Sankoff said in an interview. It continued to be a period where there was no communication, no collective bargaining, no grievance activity, really just ignoring the immigration judge's union until the labor organization's unfair labor practice complaint was settled in December. If the union disappeared, the ramifications would hit more than the 580 immigration judges. The union's role is important not just for the people appearing before immigration courts and their attorneys, but also for the public to have insight and transparency into the courts, said Greg Chen the Senior Director of Government Relations for the American Immigration Lawyers Association. The Lawyers Association supported the Judges Association in a call for immigration courts to be independent of the Justice Department. Immigration judges are department employees without the insulating protections of criminal and civil court judges. That places the department in the conflicted position of being both prosecutor and judge in immigration cases. Mizu. Legislation introduced Thursday by Representative Zoe Lofgren would transform the immigration courts into an independent judiciary. A lack of judicial independence not only undermines the integrity of the system as a whole, but adversely impacts due process for individuals in the system as well said an American Bar Association statement to the House Judiciary Committee last month. The current structure, with immigration courts and judges subject to the direct control of the Attorney General, the statement added, represents an inherent conflict with the principles of independence and fair and impartial courts necessary to satisfy due process. Those principles also are threatened when political appointees attempt to bust a judge's union. So there you have an example of why the current administration has not been able to change something that it would like to change, that it is trying to change. Um, It's just there are people, and rightfully so, there are degrees of separation of powers um, in our system of governance so that one person or one party or one whatever can't just come in and say, all right, we're changing everything. We want it to be this way, and that's just how it's going to be. There are checks and balances. Excuse me. Ah, 
Yes, much better. And uh, that's a good thing. But there are also ways to game that system, which is one thing that for four years, uh, the Trump administration most definitely tried to do, was game the system to the point where independent groups, agencies, offices, and so on, were not so independent anymore. And it has been the biggest attack I'd say the last four years has been the biggest attack on the democracy in this country (laughs) since it began. And um, it continues to be a problem because now you have, I'm treading into political territory here, but you have essentially a whole political party that at least leans towards um, undemocratic control and it supports it to a great extent and is is trying to uh, game the system in all sorts of ways. If you want an example of that, one of the biggest examples of that was the Supreme Court. When uh, President Obama nominated uh, Garland for the Supreme Court, it wasn't allowed to go through. It wasn't, they weren't allowed to vote on it. It's nothing happened. And it, it just, that seat was left empty until uh, Trump won the election and they could fill it. And that, you know, that's, (laughs) that's pretty blatant gaming of the system, if you ask me. Um, And that's a good example of that. And then when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, they rushed through, flip-flopped completely. So before it was like, oh, well, it's too close to an election. We can't uh, do this because the voters may want to elect somebody else. And then there is an election coming up, and suddenly it's like, oh, no, we got to do this right now. We can't wait. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, look at that any way you want to. And that is gaming the system to try to get an advantage and in this case, to succeed in getting an advantage for your side or your party. Uh, 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 redistricting is another, partisan redistricting is another example of that kind of thing. So this stuff is going on all the time. And um, it pays to keep an eye on it and to understand uh how it's working and who's doing what, because otherwise you don't know. I mean, it's very easy to sit back and go, ah, government's broken, can't be fixed. Well, it is broken and it can't be fixed unless people say, all right, these people who are intentionally breaking it and keeping it broken have got to go. Uh, Mitch McConnell, someone who is is breaking the government in a variety of different ways. Apparently, some enough people think that that's okay that they keep voting for him. But, uh, you know, if you really care about this country and you really care about, you know, the system that was invented. There's a lot of talk about constitutional governance by a lot of different people, but in reality, the whole point of the way the government was set up was to divide things up so that different people had control of different things and that there was a balance there. And uh, pretty much ever since then, uh, there have been people working to upset that balance and make sure that it doesn't, doesn't work. Ah, uh, so yeah, anyway, okay, I'm just keep going on and on. All right, where, what, what's next? Um, ah, how about a little good news here? We're in Illinois, right? Probably most people that are listening to this or watching this are from Illinois. There may be some that aren't, but anyway, this is from NPR, uh, Illinois State University's NPR station, I guess, entitled Illinois touted as a pioneer state for immigration rights. Okay, 
So the federal government is responsible for enacting immigration reforms, but states can make the lives of immigrants better through state laws. That's exactly what Illinois has done under Governor J.B. Pritzker. According to immigration reform advocates at a virtual League of Women Voters of McLean County panel discussion Wednesday night, Lauren Aronson, director of the Immigration Law Clinic, clinic at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign moved here from Louisiana, a state she claims has multiple barriers for immigrants trying to make a new life. This state, Illinois, is so radical it's amazing, she said. For example, Aronson said in Louisiana not only are immigrant immigration policies limiting protections, but the interpretation of already existing laws are stacked against migrants. She explained state court judges in Louisiana didn't understand that by making findings of abuse, abandonment, or neglect for immigrant kids, they were not themselves granting immigration status, but were merely allowing the children to prove their eligibility to the federal government. Fred Sow, Senior Policy Counsel for the Illinois Coalition for Immigration and Refugee Rights, we which we know as ICER, I-C-I-R-R, said Illinois has become one of the most welcoming states for non-citizens and refugees based on 10 years of hard work by his organization and others like it. The immigrant rights groups helped craft and lobbied for the Illinois Way Forward Bill signed into law by Pritzker last August. The legislation expands opportunities and protections for immigrants in Illinois. Sal pointed out the law also prohibits both state and local governments from signing or renewing contracts with the federal government to detain immigrants. Two Illinois counties challenged that provision in federal court but lost, clearing the way for the evacuation of migrant detainees by the end of the week. But Sal said while treatment of immigrants in Illinois has improved, the battle for better protections is far from over. In fact, he is scheduled to testify this week for a bill, SB 3144, that would set up a task force to make recommendations about how the state can provide legal representation for Illinois residents in immigration proceedings. Water again. Quote, if there were better ways that were more realistic and that address not only economic needs but real human needs... I would wager we would have much less of a problem with smugglers and traffickers and with the situation at the border, Sal said. Immigration Project Social Services Director Sarah Meller explained that a U.S. citizen will wait as long as 23 years to be reunited with an adult son or daughter in Mexico because of the backlog of pending visa applications. Aronson agreed the situation is ridiculous. Those who are seeking asylum face so many challenges. If you apply for asylum, you might make wait many years. I have one client who is almost five years waiting for his asylum interview, and that is not the longest, she said. Claudia Calvo, an immigrant from El Salvador with two kids who were born in the U.S., said state government funding for welcome centers, such as the one operated in Bloomington by the Immigration Project, are making life so much better for refugees and migrants. Calvo is an English as a second language student at Heartland Community College and also works as a caseworker at the center, providing support for newer arrivals. Calvo has her green card, and next year she can apply for citizenship. Meanwhile, she enjoys helping others who are in the similar position she found herself in four years ago. She can connect them to local resources for housing, transportation, financial support, and jobs. If we're not able to do it, we, the Welcome Center staff, find support, she said. We don't say no. We say yes. We can find some help. She said the Welcome Center serves as a connection to a sense of community that has emboldened her to rethink her own potential. Calva now leads a Spanish-speaking parent group. At the beginning, I would not see myself as a parent leader or being in this position right now, but these are the opportunities that being in community can give you, she said. Overall funding for immigrant services is $50 million in the current fiscal year state budget, including $30 million for direct cash assistance through the Immigrant Family Support Program. 
The pandemic-related emergency assistance funding helps Illinois immigrants face unemployment, loss of income, and medical costs, along with food and housing insecurity as a result of COVID-19. Miller said the immigration project, which supports 86 Illinois counties, has processed more than 1,300 applications for COVID financial help under the program. Miller said it helped many in the service and hospitality industry who lost their jobs or were hospitalized because of the virus. She said while many are back at work, they went deeply into debt. So that's some good news. And that's something I've also talked about before is that being an immigration advocate and living in Illinois is kind of a, a strange thing because, you know, a lot of that work is being done. And it's being done well. And um, and so a lot of what we're fighting and a lot of what I find myself talking about here on the show are, are national issues, stuff that's going on somewhere else, because those need to be worked on. And I think it's important to inform people about that kind of thing. But I also think it, I should spend a <laughs> bit more time reminding people that if you're here in Illinois, you're in a pretty good state, and we are doing things. I won't see say as well as can be expected, but you know we're doing a good job here, overall, in this state, in this area, um, and I want to see that continue, and so I, I'm not not going to stop pushing for more and better. But I think it's important to every now and then take a moment out and say, hey, this isn't bad. It's not bad at all, at least in this state. So we'll see what the future brings, but that's where we are right now. Okay, so we're approaching the end of the show here. Um, Let me try this one. This is not exactly in our theme, but... It's it's kind of similar because it goes to, well, immigration law. So this is entitled, Little Known Part of Immigration and Nationality Act Packs a Punch. Excuse me. I can't believe how, <clears throat> how dry my throat gets when I do this. Anyway. Former senior Justice Department and Labor Department officials, now with Jones Day, discuss enforcement trends, including the 2021 settlement with Facebook, important to employers of holders of holders of temporary work visas, such as H-1B visas, common in the financial sector, services, and technology sectors. Employers who rely on H-1B visa holders other temporary workers, or who sponsor green card holders should make sure that their employment practices fully comply with a little-known provision of the Immigration and Nationality Act, Section 1324B. Otherwise, they may find themselves in the crosshairs of the Justice Department, the Labor Department, plaintiffs, lawyers, or all three. A recent court decision and the accompanying, accompanying, hard to say, a recent court decision and the accompanying $14 million settlement between Facebook and the Justice and Labor Departments involving alleged H-1B visa and green card practices exemplifies these risks. President Ronald Reagan signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986. The IRCA was a quintessential congressional compromise. It established employer sanctions for hiring unauthorized immigrants, ushering in today's Form I-9 verification system. It also legalized many immigrants who were then present in the U.S. without authorization. IRCA also established 8 U.S.C. 1324B, Section 1324B, created a new kind of prohibition under the INA, employer cannot discriminate in hiring, firing, or recruitment against protected workers because of their citizenship status. Section 1324B reflects concern for American workers and for work-authorized immigrants in the U.S. It protects U.S. citizens, certain lawful permanent residents, and those granted asylum or refugee status. 
Section 1324B also authorizes employers to favor a U.S. citizen over a non-citizen if the two individuals are equally qualified, according to one of IRCA's lead architects in Congress. This exemption responded to the concern that Section uh, 1324B's inclusion of citizenship status discrimination protection for foreign immigrant workers would have the effect of discriminating against U.S. citizens. Hmm. The DOJ's Civil Rights Division enforces Section 1324B, including discrimination against U.S. workers in favor of temporary visa holders. DOJ can launch investigations, investigate charges by aggrieved workers, subpoena documents and witnesses, and file individual and class action style lawsuits against employers. Section 1324B also authorizes workers to file their own lawsuits, and prevailing plaintiffs can recover their attorney's fees as well as obtain injunctions, civil penalties, and back pay. All Section 1324B litigation starts in the Office of the Chief Administrative Hearing Officer and the U.S. Court of Appeals review their rulings. OCAHO, or the Office of the Chief Administrative Hearing Officer, OCAHO, I wish wish there was an easy way to say that, OCAHO, judges have applied Rule 23 standards to decide whether to certify a private class action. Hiring temporary visa holders also implicates the Labor Department's enforcement authority. DOL's Wage and Hour Division enforces INA protections for temporary workers. Employers who wish to sponsor a foreign worker for permanent work authorization, such as with a green card, excuse me, must obtain certification from DOL before the employer. Excuse me must obtain certification from DOL before the employer can submit an immigrant petition to the Department of Homeland Security. That process includes a certification that there are not sufficient U.S. workers able, willing, qualified, and available to accept the job opportunity and that the employment of the foreign workers will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of similarly employed U.S. workers. A false certification can carry criminal penalties under federal false statements statutes. Boy, say that fast. Federal false statements statutes. Ah. Boy, get the old lips working on that one. Okay. DOJ's late 2021 enforcement actions show that the government is continuing aggressive enforcement on Section 1324B as to temporary visa holders. For example, in November 2021, DOJ found that a Texas manufacturing company, Igloo Products Corporation, set aside positions for workers in the H-2B temporary visa program for non-agricultural jobs. According to the DOJ, the company assumed U.S. workers would not be interested in seasonal production helper positions and thus did not consider their applications. The company will pay civil penalties and make back pay available to U.S. workers discriminated against in favor of the H-2B visa holders, change its policies, and be subject to monitoring by the DOJ. In October 2021, DOJ and DOL announced a joint settlement of allegations that a social media company, Facebook, now called Meta Platforms, Inc., used the Permanent Labor Certification Program, or PERM, to sponsor 2,600 H-1B visa holders for green cards at the expense of U.S. workers. The settlement requires the company to change its practices and to pay up to $9.5 million to eligible victims of discrimination and another $4.75 million in civil penalties. Mm. The settlement grew out of a June 2021 OCAHO determination that the DOJ's lawsuit stated a valid INA claim and that compliance with DOL regulations does not, in and of itself, eliminate the possibility of an employer acting in a discriminatory manner in violation of 1324B. The settlement also resolved DOL's audit of the company's PERM application. Boy, there's a lot of acronyms here. (laughs) I guess it's a lot better than reading out the whole thing each time, but man. 
Okay, in August 2021, DOJ resolved claims that between August 2019 and June 2021, an Illinois information technology staffing and recruiting company, Ameritech Global Inc., or Incorporated, illegally posted job advertisements that announced its preference to fill positions with non-U.S. citizen workers and then failed to consider U.S. worker applicants who nevertheless applied to the job vacancies. DOJ announced it will pursue employers who discourage and refuse to hire eligible job applicants based on their citizenship or immigration status. The federal government's focus on enforcing protections for U.S. workers illustrates that employers should analyze the requirements of the INA's anti-discrimination provision and their regulatory obligations about temporary or permanent worker programs. Often, copycat litigation by the private plaintiff's bar follows government enforcement. In 2020, OCAHO recognized the ability of a U.S. citizen plaintiff in a private lawsuit validly Let me try that again. Uh, In 2020, OCAHO recognized the ability of a U.S. citizen plaintiff in a private lawsuit validly to allege a claim of discrimination against an Mm -hmm. IT company for its and its staffing, oh, for its and its staffing firm's practices in the initial hiring of an H-1B worker. Gosh, that was a really... Tough sentence to read there. Yeah, okay. I hope you understood it, because I'm going to read it again. Let's see if I can do Maybe it's me not doing a good job. In 2020, OCAHO recognized the ability of a U.S. citizen plaintiff in a private lawsuit validly to allege a claim of discrimination against an IT company for its and its staffing firm's practices in the initial hiring of an H-1B worker. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Similar claims involving advertising or the PERM program concerning U.S. workers, including potential class action style claims, could be on the horizon. Mm. So that's interesting, uh, if only to the extent of seeing how a lot of this stuff works behind the scenes, because we don't, we don't see this stuff and we, we hear about people having problems, uh, but we don't see what the, the machinery is doing. And, and this is what the machinery of the law is doing about immigration in this particular instance. This is just one very specific kind of thing, but it gives you a sense of how, complicated this stuff can be. And um, I do understand why it is hard to fix our immigration system, because immigration is just a tough thing. Like, who should this government be working on behalf of? And in what way? Like, uh, supporting workers? Okay, that's one thing. Supporting citizens? That's something else. Uh, you know, in this instance, the two don't necessarily go together. Uh, so, yeah, that's really interesting. Anyway, I've, I've run out of time. I'm sorry. But uh, you have been listening to CU Immigration here on WRFULP Urbana, 104.5 FM, and UPTV or YouTube. Uh, if you want to watch us there, we're floating around on there, too. And um, I guess we'll just talk to you again soon. So we'll see you later. Bye-bye.